Here we go, 1206, soon to be 1207. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Out of Bounds here on your hometown station, 98.1 FM, AM 1220 KHTS. Matt Frieda here with you all the way until 1 o'clock or whenever they kick me off the air. We got a jam-packed show today. Argentina world champions, the World Cup finally coming to an end. We'll be speaking with Ramsey Abishala, the editor of Urban Pitch, in just a few minutes. The MLB offseason has been flipped on its head upside down this winter. And later on today, we're going to play the cringiest college football recruiting statement that you've ever heard. Phone number to join, as always, 661 298 Five four eight seven. Andrew is in the house. Andrew, good afternoon. Good How are afternoon. You? Doing great. Doing great. Uh, right before uh, the holidays. There we right go. here, doing fantastic. Thursday, right before Christmas. Oh yeah. What do you got going on here this weekend? Oh, just staying in town. I'm not traveling. I'm not going no near any airports. None of that. Staying in town. I love Smart it. Smart man. I love it. That's the best way to spend the holidays in your pajamas or underwear. If you're me, I oh like yeah, to preferably. Hey, to each his own. You know what I mean. <laughs> but uh, whatever makes you happy and merry. <laughs> <laughs> different strokes for different folks. <laughs> That's what they say. I'll be doing a whole lot of nothing. I'm excited though because we are all in the holiday spirit. And you know, Andrew, I don't want to sound like my head's getting too big, but I think I've officially made it. I think I've arrived. Um. Your head might be a little big, but okay. uh, I'm gonna, you know, keep you right there. When I put it that way, maybe <laughs> it sounds that way. But the reason I feel that oh, why way. why do you feel that way? I feel that way, Andrew, because I am actually drinking my coffee out of this exclusive out of bounds. Oh, bounce there it is. With Matt Frieda mug that was gifted to me by our very own morning show host, Tori. And oh, fantastic. I have to say, it's the best cup of coffee I've ever had, and I have to credit it to this mug right here. Right. So a big shout out to Tori. Thank you so much. And I am very much enjoying this Peruvian That's roast coffee. I want one now. Uh, well, you know, you have to be now. on Out oh, of Bounds. I'm not you there You are yet. technically right. on okay. Out of Bounds. Right? Let's be honest. Come man. on. You're as much part of the show as me. So I got to talk to somebody. We'll make sure. We'll make it happen. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, but it's awesome. I went to the mall the other day to just do some last minute holiday shopping. I will never step foot in a mall ever again. I could have told you that was a bad idea. It's the, like, why would you do that? It is the worst place on earth. There's Not Christmas no week. parking. You have to run around <laughs> people the entire time. They never have the size that you need. It's impossible to get it done there. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to Amazon from now on. That that's where I live. The, okay, well that's you could have told me this last week, and I would have been <laughs> feeling a lot better about myself. Uh, well, in any case, it's going to be a very fun show today ahead of the holidays. I'm very excited. And of course, the biggest news that just happened on Sunday, the end of the World Cup, Argentina wins in an all-time classic. And here to talk about it with me, we have the editor at Urban Pitch. They do a great job covering soccer and the soccer lifestyle from music and fashion and of course the game itself, both here stateside and on the world stage. And that is a longtime friend of mine, Ramsey Abishala. Ram, what's up today? What's going on, Matt? It's, uh, it's it's great to be on the show, um, and and I'm I'm happy I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you could be here. You know, you being such an exclusive guy and hard to get a hold of. I can't believe you're giving me this time, Ramsey. But much appreciated by myself. Yeah, I mean, the- the issue was you were reaching out directly to me instead of going through my assistant. She handles my uh, my my calendar, and so when, when you reach out to me, I'm 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 filtering those messages out. I'm you know my inbox is, is right right right. You have people, you know, so you got to go through yeah. And you finally figured it out, so I'm, I'm glad you were able to do that. And, uh, yeah, you know, here. like I thought my head was big, but here you step in. Okay, I see how it is. Well, I'll tell you why. I don't have a mug. I don't have a face with my or a mug with my face on it yet. That's but, true. Uh, I'm, I'm getting that. That's true. Well, we'll work on it. I'm sure you're well on your way, Ramsey. Uh, obviously, <laughs> Sunday the finale, the World Cup, an all-time classic: Argentina versus France. Uh, Messi with the PK goal in the 22nd minute. They go up 2-0 after the Di Maria goal, only for Mbappe to get his PK, and then of course scoring just. 30 seconds later for the equalizer. Uh, We know how it went from there. The goal in overtime that goes to review, and eventually it does go to PKs after another PK from France. Uh, Ram, let me ask you this. Where do you put this finale in terms of greatest World Cup of all time? Is it number one? Is it in the top three? What's the feeling in the soccer world right now? Um, Yeah, so in terms of games that I've watched, I I don't think I could – 
I, I can't remember like losing my head as, as much as I did for, for this game. Um, it probably aged me a few, a few years. Um, just like, the, I mean, the stress that comes with penalties, um, is, is already, you know, like, like even for, for, for whatever match, you know, an MLS cup final went to, to, to penalties. I was, I was a wreck. Um, this is obviously the stakes are much higher for, uh, for, for the world cup. So I, I, it's hard for me to watch those types of games, but in terms of, I mean, the, the moments, the narratives, um, it's, it's everything that you could have wanted from, from a World Cup, and, and it's definitely one the, – the greatest game that I've watched, um, uh, World Cup or otherwise. Uh, yeah, and definitely. I think a lot of people share that sentiment with you, even non-soccer fans. Like, we know this social media trend where it's, like, cool to rag on soccer for some reason. You know, like, oh, soccer's so boring. I don't know why anyone yeah. would You know, like, it's not cool that people are doing that. Like, they think it's cool. But even those non-soccer fans came out of watching that game and said, wow, that was insane between the actual matchup on the field the intensity of the crowd from both sides and the billions of eyeballs that were on it certainly was had my heart in my throat the entire game just watching that and I say that as someone that's not a huge fan but definitely pays attention to the big stage like that yeah yeah I mean and then Dana White said something um I don't even know how long ago it was a month ago I think it was leading up to the world cup basically just saying that you know soccer is the least talented sport. Uh, you know, there's a reason why little kids play it. <laughs> um, and and those, the, those comments have not aged uh, well, but, um, you know, I, I would like to get his thoughts on, on the world. So maybe, uh, maybe he'll be the next guest. Yeah, no, that's uh, good. Cause uh, actually on the know. other line, Dana White, Dana, how you doing yeah. today? <laughs> he wants to know where you are. He's coming uh, to beat you up. Apparently. Uh, I will yeah. not disclose that information, but I think he lives in Woodland Hills. <clears throat> um, I appreciate it. Protecting the sources. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Hey, Messi obviously gets this elusive world cup. Now, uh, you know, he had nothing left to prove. It was just kind of like the cherry on top and what is one of the greatest careers of all time. But but now that he does have it and probably in what will all, in all likelihood be his final World Cup appearance, is it fair to say now, if we, if we, can we call Messi the GOAT at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think with or without this World Cup, he has a very strong argument um, to being the greatest of all time. I mean, like in all sports, you know, it's hard to compare uh, eras to eras. Um, you know, the two... Uh, like kind of in that conversation or, or, uh, is Maradona and, and Pele. So obviously in two different eras, you can't really compare the, the, the competition and, and, and things like that. But um, in terms of, I, like he's the greatest player I've ever watched. You know, that's, that's, that's just like the, um, the, the measuring, the only real measuring point that I can, uh, in, in terms of like my analysis. Um, but like I was watching the game with the Ronaldo fan. Uh, and he was just so angry the entire game. He was, like, calling for France to win, and, you know, he was way more wrecked than I am. And I think, um, really, the, Messi winning this World Cup, if anything, has the biggest effect on Ronaldo fans because for years that debate has kind of been neck and neck, and this just kind of puts that uh, to, to bed. Um, but, I mean, in, in terms of the greatest of all time, yeah, I think I think he certainly has the case. Like, he, he has entered that... Um, that discussion, uh, like objectively, there's like you, you could be whoever, like a fan of whoever. There's no way that you know when you're talking about the greatest soccer players, footballers to ever play, he he has to be in that conversation now. And I mean, I think he was already before this World Cup, but now it's just undeniable. There's no you know uh, matters of opinion or anything that can that can kind of uh, 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 dispute that. Yeah, and this yeah, is. That's, that's, it, it, it's one of those arguments, it's semantics. It's really about preference. It's really about generation. It's almost like the whole, who's the greatest of all time in the NBA? You know, is it Michael Jordan? Is it Kobe Bryant? Is it LeBron James? You know, it really goes between the eras of when they played and based on when you watch them play is really, you know, and so it's you're really never going to get a clear answer. It's such a, like, first take kind of, like, argument there, you know, right. like they do on ESPN. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and the thing is with that they're great because, you know, it's it's great to have those discussions. It's great to you know argue about sports. I mean, I mean, the, the part of the reason why we love sports is because there's a lot to debate, you know, and it's, it's fun to do that. But in doing, uh, I, I was reading a piece on uh, I think it was on ESPN that was saying that instead of you know 
like looking at athletes as athletes and comparing them to one each other. Um, he he said something about like comparing them like artists, like we do with artists, and appreciating them That's for a great what they example. contributed. Like no one, no one, no one is fight, like saying like, "Oh, Van Gogh's the goat." Like um, <laughs> Michelangelo is, was trash. Hey, I'm I'm against, personally a Rembrandt uh, guy <laughs> myself, but <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, uh, so just appreciating, you know, what each because I mean, in in a lot of ways, sports and art, you know, like it's. It's, it's an art form. They mimic um, each as other. Much as, it, as it is. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? And someone like Messi who's just done it so beautifully and, and so gracefully, like, he's been compared to an artist, you know, throughout his career. So um, I thought that was a really interesting point and something that I'm definitely guilty of, you know, whether it's, you know, like you said, NBA, talking about, you know, the LeBron versus Jordan debate, which has seemingly been going on for forever. Um, but, you know, it's, it's fun to have these debates, but at the end of the day, like, you have to just really appreciate it all the contributions that all these, you know, fantastic athletes um, have, have given to us. Yeah, and we'll never have that concrete proof because, you know, someone's going to be better at something or other, and then you look at, like, who, where they played and right. the era that they played, who you know, all that kind of stuff, and it's really impossible to actually do. Uh, real quick, kind of tailing off of that one, is would you say Mbappe is now kind of the next in kin here? Like, I mean, he obviously wins the Golden Boo here and just tremendous talent. He, I mean, so he's 23 years old. I think he just turned 24, actually. Um, but he is accomplished. Like, if there was a moment, I think it was in, in the extra time, he was, like, at the corner of the box, and he sliced through two defenders. Like, he had no business, like, creating an open shot on goal opportunity. He did so. Like, the angle was kind of, uh, was, was tough. So, I don't know if he put it on frame for a save or what, but if he would have scored in that moment, that would have given France the lead and... and uh, offensively, it would have won the game. Like you have to think that okay, now maybe this guy's going to be in the conversation of the, of the greatest of all time, despite being at the time just 23 years old. Um, but he's definitely the heir apparent. Um, him and uh, Erling Haaland um, on on Manchester City, uh, who didn't feature in the World Cup with because uh, Norway didn't didn't make it. So he's kind of uh, taken taken uh, a bit of a hit in terms of like narrative, just because you know he, he hasn't really been on the scene for the last month, but. Um, he's tearing things up in the Premier League. He's scoring goals at you know an, uh, an all-time pace. Um, but basically, those two guys are at the top of the game right now. Um, Messi has obviously proven that he's still in that upper echelon. Whereas uh, you know someone like Ronaldo, who I mean Messi, Ronaldo has been like the, 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 the top two guys for the last I don't know decade plus. Uh, Ronaldo's kind of tailed off a little bit. He is older than Messi, but um, yeah, I mean now people are talking about Mbappe and, and Holland like the Messi Ronaldo. So I hope that that com- comparison doesn't it, it doesn't become as you know embittered and and you know toxic. Uh, oh, it it's will. It's a little bit exhausting. It will. <laughs> yeah, but but knowing knowing sports fans, um, you know it it, it 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 it's going to be. But yeah, I mean Mbappe has definitely proven that he is one of, if not the best um, footballers alive right now. Um, what he does with the, the rest of I mean, if you were to retire right now, he'd still be an all time great. Uh, he's got plenty of years ahead of him he's already been in two world cup finals yeah absolutely at age 23 let's see i think we might have lost him rams are you still there you look at what he's accomplished yeah can you hear me oh yeah now we got you back okay good yeah, yeah mbappe yeah. at the age of 23 still uh lots to prove but already accomplished a lot as well no doubt about yeah, it yeah 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 so he's i mean he's just when you look at his resume and what he's accomplished at this age it's, it's really mind-blowing and to think that he has so much more to to do and he's been in two world cups World Cup Finals has already won one, has a hat trick in the other. Like it's it's really just um, uh, mind blowing what this what this guy's accomplished. So yeah. I'm excited. I I really love watching him play. I'm 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 excited to see him um, moving forward. Yeah. Now looking ahead to the 2026 World Cup, uh, it's going to be hosted here in North America, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, U.S. men's team was bounced in the round of 16 here in this World Cup that has just completed after losing 3-1 to to Netherlands. But in reality, they probably overachieved, at least according to where most pundits pegged them entering this tournament. You know, they tied with Wales and England and then a 1-0 win over Iran. Um, do you think it's fair to say, can we officially now go on the record, U.S. is on the rise, and might we see them advance in this upcoming World Cup here on home turf? Yeah, so I think I think making it out of the group was the number one objective for the the U.S. team this year, um, and they did their job. I, I thought they, they they played to the expectations, um, 
Uh, and you, you, want, you, you want to talk about delusional fans? U.S. men's national team fans are are up there. <laughs> I believe that uh, we will win. I believe that yeah, we will win. I mean that chant. Uh, that chant it, it makes me sick. It, it, it really does. Um, but looking, I mean, we had the youngest team in terms of players that played on the field. The lineups that we had. Um, I saw a graphic. It was like something under. I think it might have been something under between 23 and 24 years old was the average age of players who played, not just on the roster. We had the second youngest roster. In, in, in general. Um, so this team is very young. I mean, we have some re- really, really promising players, not only that were on the, the roster this year, but that will, um, you know, presumably be um, on the roster in 26. Um, you know, you got guys like Tyler Adams, uh, Weston McKinney, and obviously Christian Pulisic, who, who are, are really, really, like, you know, impressive core of players that you can build a team around. You know, Brendan Aronson is another guy. Um, that, that that has a lot of hype playing in the Premier League, but um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I, I was th- this team is fun to watch. You know, um, they're they're not all the way consistent um, uh, as we've seen in in you know this this tournament. Um, the first half against Wales, they went up one one nil. Probably could have been up two, um, and then played some of the best soccer that they have ever played that I've ever seen them play. Then come out in the second half and just kind of lay an egg give up a, a stupid penalty uh, late in the game. Um, so it, it, it was very evident that this was a young team, but they were very hungry, and they played, I thought, pretty well um, as a whole. So I was happy with the way they played. And I'm, I'm optimistic, you know. Um, as, as, as There's still that kind of chip on the shoulder with American soccer and, uh, you know, how they're not really taken seriously. But I thought this year a lot of teams, like you, you saw England was, was taking them pretty seriously, the Netherlands. Um, and the round of 16 was taking them serious. Um, so I think, you know, people have them circled on the roster. It's not just a, a, a rollover team anymore. And they have international talent. Um, the the uh, academy system here in the U.S. has improved. So we're, we're actually starting to develop quality players. Um, so come 2026, you know, I think getting past that fourth game, getting into the fifth, playing a fifth game in the semifinals, maybe even getting to a quarterfinals, the, the first, uh, uh, that, that, or sorry, the quarterfinals and maybe getting into the semifinals. Um, for the first time ever, uh, or first time since like 1930 or something like that, yeah. um, would be a realistic thing. But we just have to see how the, how, the, how you know things pan out over the next four years. But I don't think uh, it's obviously way too early um, to, to predict. But I don't think it's like completely uh, uh, diluted to, to think that you know maybe we can make it past the fifth game into a sixth game on our home turf with you know the fans, the the energy that comes with hosting your own World Cup. Um, you know, it didn't happen with Qatar this year, but we've seen in the past South Korea, um, uh, Russia. Uh, you know, that home cooking is always uh, provides an advantage. Ugh, I hate Russian food. Thing. They don't cook yeah. anything good in Russia. I don't know what you're talking about, Ramsey, but okay, I'll go with it. We are talking with Ramsey <laughs> Abishala, the editor at Urban Pitch. <laughs> they do a great job at covering soccer and soccer lifestyle from music and fashion and, of course, the game itself. Uh, real quick, I did want to touch before we get off the U.S. men's national team, the uh, choice not to really play uh, Reina here in the tournament. Um, you know, what, what were the feelings and sentiments about that from most soccer fans, U.S. Uh, soccer fans at least, and you personally? Yeah, so, I mean, when in the moment, right, um, Greg Berhalter, the U.S. manager, has taken just um, a, a lot of heat. Some warranted, some really unfair. But um, when they when he wasn't playing Gia Reyna, he was playing, uh, you know, a couple of other guys ahead of them that, you know, um, probably shouldn't have been playing. Um, they, it was it was a thing on, on Berhalter. They were just all ragging on him. They're saying, what the hell's wrong with this guy? What uh, what is he thinking? You know, he should be fired. This is this is not, you know, this guy's out of his mind. Um, and then, um, you know, and I kind of agreed. I, I, I tend to, you know, have a more realistic, um, um, uh, like, set of expectations when it comes to him. You know, I think he's probably not the manager to take us to the next step, but he's done a decent job with, with the roster that he has. But when, you know, when all of a sudden, you know, this guy, Gio Reyna, who's playing in the Bundesliga with, with uh, um, uh, Borussia Dortmund, playing at a high level, um, is one of the most talented players on the roster. And right, a 20-year-old, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to me, it was like it was fishy. Like, what, what, what's going on? Like, you know, what? Why is Berhalter not doing this? And then there was rumors that there's a, a, a rift in the locker room. And then it, it came out that um, you know there was some attitude problems that he was having. He was right. not happy with the uh, the playing time that he had. Um, apparently, I don't. I honestly don't know how the, the validity of this, but there's reports of um, a player vote 
that, you know, to, to send them home. And that was narrow. It was like 13 to 12 or something like that. I don't know if that's true or not. There's been, you know, conflicting reports here and there on, 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 on social media. But it was definitely something that this guy's talented enough to be playing. He should be on the field. But, um, you know, being 20 years old, um, you know, the maybe it's, it's, it's more of like a maturity thing. Right. Like uh, when I was 20, I was nowhere near, um, uh, you know, ready to be performing on, on a level that he is. So, Trust me, I, I, I know because I knew you when you were 20 and I was yeah, in the same way. Yeah, so yeah, I don't think either yeah. of us would be ready throwing, for that world stage. I was stage. throwing Xbox controllers, um, <laughs> you know, after getting scored on, on a counterattack to FIFA. Um, you know, like, and, and you're just crossing, cro- crossing me to death. So. Oh man, you're killing uh, me. You're killing me. Come on. I mean, I do have a mug <laughs> with my name on it, but let's, you know, keep me in yeah. check here. Uh, real quick. Cause you guys do more than just actually covering the game. Uh, you guys are, uh, just about soccer lifestyle as a whole. Who are the best kids yeah. in the tournament here? Uh, best kids in the tournament. We actually did not see him in action. Um, it was Mexico's away Jersey. Mm. Um, uh, fantastic design, um, uh, inspired by Mexican culture. Uh, FIFA's laws say that you know the home kit is the the, the main jersey is, is going to be worn unless there is a you know conflict in colors, and we didn't un- unfortunately see that conflict uh, to where Mexico would wear their their away jersey, but um, it still is you know by far one um, the the best jersey that. Oh yeah, uh, I like I those. So. I'm yeah. looking at them right yeah. now. Ooh, and the back is kind of just left blank, the little uh, taper yeah. on the sides. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. It, 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 it's it's really a really great design. Um, uh, Japan's away jersey is, is, is really cool. Um, um, a couple others, you know, Germany's. I thought Germany's home kit was was, was great, but um, yeah, Mexico's is my favorite. Very nice. Well, you always had great taste. I gotta say. Uh, look, we got only a minute or so here, but uh, a pleasure talking with you. And I just had one bonus question here for you. Um, it's kind of a tough one, but just kind of off the top of your head, um, who would you say? Was the best FIFA player that you ever were roommates with in college? Just if you had oh, an idea. Oh, that's tough. Um, it certainly wasn't me, but um, I'd have to give this one to Davy Castiola because he did win the uh, 20, <coughs> I believe it was 2015. It was a 2015 FIFA. Hold on, Anani, I'm going to stop you right there. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> we're out of time. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did you just say? <laughs> because we kept the scoreboard. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm just, uh. <laughs> Davy Cash, Davy Cash. Yeah, they, they, he did win. He did win the the final over Matt Frieda. So that there, there was that. Um, it was a little bit of a controversial decision. There wasn't VAR. At well, the time. it's FIFA after um, all. There's always going to be some controversy and some things looming in the shadows. But yeah, sure, let him believe that. Okay, sure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that, that when it comes to Pokemon Stadium, though. Um, Frida, uh, you're definitely the best, oh, uh, best that you. I know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, hey, Rams, great talking yeah. with you. Uh, thank you for all this great information. Uh, where can people uh, check out Urban Pitch? Listen, I know you guys do a podcast as well. Uh, let people know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, check us out on urbanpitch.com. Um, we do a weekly podcast. You can find it uh, you know, wherever you get your podcasts on Tuesdays. Um, uh, we just had Javane Brown, uh, who's a Jamaican national team player. He plays for Vancouver Whitecaps and MLS. Um, here's our latest episode, but you know, on socials, just you know, uh, urban dot pitch on Instagram, urban underscore pitch on on Twitter, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's where you can find us. Very nice. Well, everyone, go check it out, Urban Pitch. You can find it on all the social medias and their website over there. Ramsey Abashala, the editor over there. Appreciate your time today. We'll talk later. All right, kid. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. I uh, appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. The MLB offseason has been bananas. We're going to get into all that. You're listening to Out of Bounds on your hometown station, KHTS FM 98.1 and AM 1220. Yeah, baby, we're back. 12.33 on KHTS FM 98.1 AM 1220, your hometown station. Matt Frieda here with you all the way until 1 o'clock. This afternoon, just like every Thursday, we were just talking with Ramsey Abu Shala, the editor over at Urban Pitch. Uh, he did spread a little misinformation. I was the FIFA champion of uh, college with him, but that's all right. We'll let him believe otherwise. That's fine. Whatever, dude. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, uh, great coverage over there at Urban Pitch. Be sure to go check out their uh, podcast, their website, everything over there. They do a tremendous job. Andrew, um, I have a few things in front of me here. And like I said, it's the holiday season, Thursday, right before Christmas. Um, and I got this gift here from Lori, who works at the station. Yes, yes. She is. She she, she's like the mom of the station. She's the best. We love her. Oh, yeah. She does everything for us. I mean, we'd be a mess without Lori. 
Hands down. Yeah. Uh, and she didn't want me to open it on air. I'm not going to, but just shaking it, I am pretty sure that it's a bike. Right? Yeah. Uh, it might be. Might be a little something else. You don't I don't think know. it's a bike in here? I don't think it's a bike. Okay. Oh, uh, well, it fits in my hands. <laughs> but should like... you open it? I don't. I, I'm going to wait because Lori asked me not to. However, I do have my scratch off here. It's a gingerbread man scratch off. So let's take a look and see if I'm a big winner because, God, I would really like to go retire in Cabo or something like That'd that. That'd be fantastic. Mm. There was that story coming out of, I think it was Kentucky. Kentucky where, Kentucky, where coworkers exchange gifts, as we do, and they exchange scratchers, and Someone it won, won. for 175000 So hopefully you win so 175000 if, if you're the person that right, won do you, that, do you split it? Do you get half back? Do you get like the amount with the card to say it was a $5 one, like here's $10, you doubled your investment? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But let's be real about it, because taxes, you're only going to take about half of that back. Okay, yeah, right? I'll take half. No, That's right, fine. but I think, so let's call it 175, let's call it 90,000, you're going to actually get the person that won the scratch right. off. Maybe throw them five Gs. Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, I like, think. Th- th- thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, a little bit. But yeah, so uh, was it 175,000? Let's see. Uh, win up to 1,000 oh, were, okay. were the options here. And I probably should have read the rules, but I didn't. Uh, uncover a money bag symbol to automatically win that prize. Uncover a, what do they call the, um, the a mistletoe, a mistletoe symbol to win double that prize. Um, yeah, no, actually, no, didn't win. Ah, thanks a lot, Lori. Such is life, huh? What are you going to do? God, I wish I lived in Kentucky. I might have won the 175 grand. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, whatever. This is why we can't have nice things. Uh, MLB offseason has been absolutely nuts. A complete crapshoot of who's going where. We've had trades. We've had signings. Yesterday, in fact, we even, in the wee hours of the morning, had a guy who had already signed with a new team leave his contract and bolt for another team. I mean, it has been absolutely bizarre. Before we get into that, though, we have had a combined three billion, yes, billion with a B, three billion five hundred sixty-seven million and six hundred forty-one thousand dollars spent by all thirty MLB teams. Since this offseason began in the first week of November, $3.5 billion spent by the 30 teams combined on acquiring players and signing new players. I mean, $300 million contracts are almost a regularity the way they're handed out nowadays. And there have been a handful of them that have been given this offseason to players. Andrew, I want to ask you, if you had to guess, give me the top I don't know. Let's say eight spenders so far this offseason in Major top League Baseball. Eight. Yeah, it's an obscure number, but I'm doing it for a reason. So right. Okay. Let's, okay. Um, let's go with the uh, minor league team that poses as an MLB team. Uh, the San Diego Padres, I believe, are kind of up there. Padres are on there. Um, number the, four. Let's go the Phillies. Phillies are I number three. Um, I'm pretty sure. I think I know number one, but I'll leave that. I'll leave that All right, uh, fair right now. Um, and then other than that, oh, the Cubs, Cubs could, five. which took half of the Dodgers roster, uh, and the Red Sox, which also has, I think, about Red five. Sox. Not top no, eight. No, really. Not top eight. Oh, okay. So, so far you've got three, four, five, Phillies, Padres, Cubs. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. And then, well, I know, I know number one for sure. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I'm not, who my other made big moves? All right, so I'll give it to you now. The Giants at number eight, 100 million. The Astros at number seven, 105 million. Wow. The Rangers, 210 million, number six in spending. That's mainly because of signing Jacob DeGrom. To there his you go. Massive contract. Then you got the Cubs, Padres, Phillies, you said. And then number two, the New York Yankees at 500. Oh, how did I forget the Yankees? Jeez, right. come on. Come on. I mean, the, again, okay. the massive contract to Aaron Judge. Oh, okay, right. They did sign Rodon as well. So that's another okay. big one. I'm and surprised then, the Giants were still on that list, even though uh, what transpired here. Oh, boy. It's been a rough sledding <laughs> for the Giants, has it not? I mean, oh, I love it, though. I love I seeing it. Absolutely should. You As you should as a Dodgers fan. Yes. This has been a torturous process for the Giants who thought they had Aaron, quote, arson judge as he was mistakenly <laughs> referred to by john Heyman, an mlb reporter only for him to go back to the yankees and then had this same very similar actually probably worse situation happen yesterday which we're going to get into in a minute here but the number one spender 
is the New York Mets at $806 million, which, you know, I'm a huge New York Mets fan, so I'm very happy about this. Um, some are applauding this. Some are upset because they believe it's good for baseball for these owners to be spending this way. The players are happy. People are going to be kind of focused on it in the offseason. You know, it's crazy news, these contracts getting handed out. Some aren't happy, though, because – the parity in the league is not going to be as similar anymore because there's these teams that are willing to spend outrageously while others are not, whether it's by choice or not. And personally, I feel it's by choice. I mean, some of these owners, all of these owners are billionaires. No one wants to hear billionaires fight about other billionaires. Right. And then on, on, I get the sports loyalty and everything kind of like that. Like it should be fair, should have a cap and things like that. But don't be mad because my owner has uh, – my team has more money to go buy players and yours has to sell it. So I'm more on that side where if you have the money, go spend it. Get the best team you can buy because why not? Right. And what I'm getting at still at this point, like these guys are all billionaires. Don't let the athletics or the Cincinnati Reds <laughs> or the Pittsburgh Pirates fool right. you. All of those owners are billionaires over and over. And they have the money and resources. They don't have the willingness to invest in the teams. But the reason I asked you for the top eight and not say the top five is because those eight teams, Mets, Yankees, Phillies, Padres, Cubs, Rangers, Astros, Giants, have combined to spend $2,292,341,000. So $2.3 million between those eight teams, which is 84% of the total outlay from all the 30 teams combined. In just the top eight? All formed by those My eight teams. Goodness. They have spent 84% of the money this offseason so far. Wow. And see, with those teams, you expect those teams. But it's great when a team like the Seattle Mariners last season were blowing up and they had like the least – you know, payroll uh, out there. Exactly. So, so it's great on that aspect. Right. Or the Tampa Bay Rays. Right. Who oh, yeah. Do balling on a budget. Yeah. All, all the time. See, and that's where you love those Cinderella stories. Yeah. And to be fair, some of these teams here were not perennial high spenders for the entire last two decades. Like, I mean, the Padres were never the big spenders that they've become now. The Rangers, Astros really never were big spenders. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of about opportunity and seizing it. And these teams have shown a willingness to go out and get those big name players. But, you know, some of these teams are just recently kind of getting into the upper echelon of spending. And it's really a matter of teams putting out the best possible product for their fans. And one team that's been doing that has been the New York Mets, and the rich continues to get richer. Yes, yes, that's right. The New York Mets, not your daddy's New York Mets, the lovable losers, born in 1962 after the Dodgers and Giants. Left New York. How could they? They left my grandma, a Brooklyn diehard Dodger fan, crying on her way home from school. This is what you get now. The Mets have become big spenders, and it's really because of the new owner that just came in, Steve Cohen, over the last two years. But the biggest reason I'm bringing it up, I'm not going to talk Mets the whole time, but because of what happened with the San Francisco Giants, as we alluded to earlier, a player signing with the team and bolting in the middle of the night. So Carlos Correa and the San Francisco Giants agreed to a 13-year deal for $350 million a week ago yesterday. Now, everybody assumed, great, it's over, you can move on with your life, there's other free agents that teams were looking at at that point. And then all of a sudden, on Monday morning, or I guess it would be afternoon, we heard that the Carlos Correa press conference has been delayed, that it's been postponed because of a discrepancy between the team and Correa's agents as far as his medicals go. So now all these deals, when you sign him, it's always pending a physical. Correa goes in, takes his physical, Giants see something that they don't like, and at the last minute, they actually say, you know what, we want to wait a little bit. So Correa's agents actually said, all right, that's fine. We're going to give you until one o'clock to figure it out. Otherwise, we need to go and talk to other teams for our client here. So Correa actually came so close to being introduced by the Giants. He was in his uniform, all dappered up, haircut, beard all trimmed nicely, getting ready to go up, take some pictures and get introduced as a San Francisco Giant. He takes it off the jersey, that is, because the Giants don't like the medical 
and he bolts to the New York Mets in the middle of the night. Correa's agent speaks with the Mets owner, Steve Cohen. Bing, bang, pow, Correa gets a 12-year $315 million deal. And supposedly, this comes from Scott Boris, who's the shark of all MLB agents. As I got Peter here, who's going to be doing Ask Brian next. So be sure to listen at 1 o'clock. A huge Mets fan. We love this guy. Uh, but Steve Cohen, the Mets owner, supposedly completing this deal on the phone while on vacation in Hawaii on his vacation, <laughs> sipping martinis. So anyway, all this to say, uh, the New York Mets have gotten a lot better this offseason. They've acquired Justin Verlander. They acquired the Japanese starting pitcher, Kodai Senga, who was highly touted. They've now brought in Carlos Correa, which really is the cherry on top. And as we said, the number one spending team this offseason by a significant margin, $300 million more than any other team. And they're going to have a payroll of over $500 million, which is just absurd. So, Andrew, I bring all this up. Because it is somewhat Dodgers related in a way. We saw, I actually asked you last week off air, or no, I think it was on air. I said, you know, your feelings on Correa going to the Giants. And you said you were rip roaring, ready to go to boo him. And, you know, he's going to become public enemy number one to the Dodgers even more than he already is. But at the same time, the Giants had a decent offseason, but they weren't that huge threat on paper to the Dodgers. You still probably win in the NL West. You shouldn't be too concerned, even with Correa in their lineup. Now that he's going to the Mets, who have already won 101 games last year, now huge offseason, which situation do you think would have been better as a Dodger fan, World Series aspirations? Um, w going to the Giants, for sure. <laughs> because, yeah, we would have really booed him, and in, in, in like, you, like you said, but it wouldn't have been a threat pretty much other than, other than that, really. It's the Giants like, oh, you have Correa? Great. He's a great player. I'm not going to lie. He, he's fantastic. But he's one guy. Exactly. And yes, one guy can turn it around, but you still need a whole team there. And I don't think the Giants have that. Right. Um, and this is, you know, unbiased opinion. I honestly don't think they have that right now. Um, but that could have created more uh, a building block of, hey, we have Correa. Okay, now let's bring some other people. But now that that's completely gone and Judge is completely gone, like, what do you do uh, up there in the north in the Bay? They're, they're left holding the bag. I mean, this is torturous if you're a Giants <laughs> yeah. fan, the way things went here this offseason. Yeah. They were on the precipice of getting Aaron Judge. The reports came out and then ends up going back to the Yankees. And then they technically had Carlos Correa. They had him in uniform ready to go up for his presser. And at the last second, they go, you got to take that off. We don't like your right. presser. And, and, like, speaking of, like, shenanigans, do you think they jumped the gun too early? Uh, the Giants speaking uh -huh. on saying, okay, we're going to spend all this money and then kind of take a step back, take a breath and be like, well, wow, maybe we shouldn't spend all this money. I think they got, I think it was a little bit of both. I think they got cold feet because it was an enormous contract. 13 years is a big commitment. Yeah. I mean, that is a huge and $350 million. I think their number one target was Aaron Judge, who grew up in the Bay, a Giants fan. Right, Fresno State? Right. Just exactly. right out there. There you go. So I think they settled for Correa. He got the big contract. They probably were a little cold about it, I think, because this medical report sounds bogus. It doesn't Oh, it definitely like does. Issue. When he was, you know, in uniform, pretty much signed on the dotted line, pretty much, uh, or at least had his pen to paper, just didn't sign yet, yeah. and then just to forego it, I yeah. mean... Exactly. Come on. Exactly. And I think they were hoping that would uh, allow them for potentially to renegotiate at a more preferable price for them. And it didn't work out. So his agent, who is Scott Boris, the greatest agent in baseball, if not all sports, went out and the Mets were actually close to getting him or at least in talks with him prior to him even agreeing with the Giants. Uh, a week ago to their initial agreement. So the Mets were involved even at the last minute there. But this all to say, I mean, it's just bizarre. Nothing like this is really of this magnitude has ever happened before. No, not in that hour where you were going to sign and then the next, uh, not even a whole day passed where you land another huge deal uh, with a team that, you know, on paper should take it all, right, really. Right. Well, the Mets like to make things very you know? hard. So yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say any sure, no sure bet. I can promise you I've been a Mets fan for 28 years. It's been torture. I have the scars to prove it. It's like the Michael Myers Halloween series. Michael Myers has been killed in like every which way possible, still keeps coming back. 
I am Mets fans are like Michael Myers from this team. You've had your head cut off. You've been lit on fire. You've been <laughs> shot. You've fallen off a roof. And you still come back every April on opening day and you say, let's go Mets for some reason. It's actually – It's the season. Huh? It's bizarre. And I'll, <laughs> real quick, I'll say this before. I got one more for you, actually. Uh, there was a about three years ago a therapist or psychotherapist in New York City that was offering free therapy – to New York Mets fans. My goodness. <laughs> just to get in our I want heads. to see the numbers of people that actually took that up. I would have. Just to see. <laughs> just, just to, to see, see what she had to say. Yeah. Right. She'd give you those little ink blots, right? And I'd say, yeah. it looks like Mr. Met. I got to be honest. <laughs> it's it's right? Willie Randolph. That's Daryl Strawberry. Like, we are obsessive yeah. people. But hopefully it works out. Again, you got to go out and play the games. Real quick, do you think there should be a salary cap or a salary floor in Major League Baseball? Uh, I, I say cap. cap, a cap just so, I mean, everybody can get, you know, on that same playing field, uh, no pun intended, but, mm. uh, just so we can't have the, the, the Pittsburgh uh, pirates out there or, uh, you know, another mid market team complaining and, and fans complaining that we don't get the shot. We don't get the big stars. Uh, we don't pay for them. All the LA teams and New York teams get everybody. Um, because you can pay for them. Well, so can your owners. Uh, but they don't so, want to but spend they, the But money. they don't want to spend the money. Exactly. exactly. But, you know, if you have that cap, then it can uh, be evenly distributed, uh, yeah. the talent-wise. Yeah, and it's something that's been talked about a lot. It's something that, you know, a lot of teams and fans have clamored for, especially owners now who are not too happy with uh, Steve Cohen back in New York. So, interesting to see. But regardless, been a very uh, intriguing offseason seeing all the big names go to different places. It is 12.50. We're going to take a quick break before we wrap up the show. You're going to hear one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard when it comes to college football recruiting. Don't touch that dial you are listening to your hometown station khts fm 98.1 and am 1220 oh yeah the kinks i like the van halen version but uh i'm not gonna complain about it at all andrew knows what he's doing over here dj andrew very nice uh hey it's uh 1253 we're gonna wrap up the show here it is bowl season and if you need something to do if you're a sports fan over this weekend and then of course the uh new year's weekend there's gonna be a whole bunch of bowl games coming up here as the uh, college football season concludes uh one of the most interesting wrinkles here in college football over the last year or so has been the transfer portal that has been introduced basically allowing teams or rather players to transfer to other teams which was not really something that previously was uh, done as easily as it has now become with it but one of the other interesting things has been nils and nils if you don't know what it is it's uh, basically now a player's ability to earn money based off their name, image, and likeness, hence the term NIL. Previously, of course, uh, college football was always an amateur sport where actually we saw a lot of players be penalized and schools be penalized when they would earn money from the school or in other ways. But now it's actually fully accepted and even embraced. And we're seeing some college athletes making upward of a million dollars a year from doing this, whether it's through social media, advertisements, whatever it is. But Dabo Sweeney, who is the uh, Clemson football head coach, uh, they're actually one of the perennial winners in college football, number seven in the rankings this year. They'll actually be playing in the Orange Bowl next Friday, December 30th versus Tennessee. He uh, believes NILs has been the number one reason that this program has been so successful, except he doesn't maybe use the same definition of NIL as we do. Go ahead and give this a listen. Thinking through it, and I honestly, I mean, for me, we we built this program on NIL. We really did. And, and I... It's probably different than what you're thinking, though. We, we built this program uh, in God's name, image, and likeness. And that's how I look at it. So, <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, NIO, you really could have went a, a lot of ways with that. Next in line, National Institute for Literacy. I don't know, but in name image and likeness for god okay hey you know what i'm not against it if that's what you can do to build camaraderie go ahead for it dabble swinney's just a goofy guy if you ask me so whatever's working for them they've obviously been very successful so good for them real quick i had to rip these off here as we conclude here and thanks for listening and i hope you all have happy holiday season here as we head into the big weekend some of the worst college bowl names of all time and i'm sorry but they really need to start finding some new ads the tony the 
Tiger Sun Bowl. If you need something to do, you can watch the Wasabi Fenway Bowl. There's also, and I know this might be tough with the Fenway Bowl coming up, but the Cheez-It Citrus Bowl is also going to be uh, being played. And then my personal favorite, because I personally wear their hardcore underwear, that's the Duluth Trading Cure Bowl, which will be (laughs) a word salad in and of itself right there. Uh, Yeah, lots of bowl games coming up. Uh, The Duke's Mayo Bowl is also one of my personal favorites. So have fun. Enjoy the holidays coming up. Thank you so much for listening. You have been listening to Out of Bounds with Matt Frieda here on your hometown station KHTS FM 98.1 AM 1220. Peace.